All right, we should be good to go. But the closer you can stand to the podium, the easier it is for everybody. Interesting that, that that choice was made because um, in the last several months, Mac malware has actually kind of exploded, especially in the news. Have any of you uh, paid attention to the news for, for Mac malware? Yeah, some of the um, some of the higher profile ones I wanted to highlight here. Uh, of course, the one that just that came out very recently was the NSO group selling uh, iPhone zero days. Now. I'll go ahead and give a caveat. Um, iPhone security is closely tied to OS X security, and we'll see why in just a second. But I just wanted to kind of whet your appetite a little bit for what's what's there. So we have uh, the NSA group, um, zero day for iPhones. We also have, um, well, we also have uh, Key Ranger and a few other like well-known, here we go, uptick in malware vulnerabilities. Um, basically this talk is um, kind of a what you need to know as far as not just what's out there but also the, the vulnerabilities that exist within OS X itself. Now I'm not going to release any zero days right now, but if you're seeking to secure a, even from your home all the way through a business, if there's Macs on the network, um, this is the information that you're probably going to need to know. To go back to my uh, slides though, um, security engineer by day, um, research the security at night. I particularly work on large scale systems, so it's not entirely security related, although we, we have security stuff that flows through the system. But the real exciting part, you know, the research part is what I'm going to share with you today. This all really began because I recently got my um, a few events that happened uh, kind of simultaneously. I got my mother to uh, change to OS X, and my daughter at the same time she was really involved in Minecraft and downloading these um, mods for games. And um, both of those kind of made me really nervous. And then I started thinking about it, like what, what. I can recognize a malware installation or malware infestation on a Windows system, and I would know relatively where to go look. You know, start a folder and registry and stuff like that. But where would I go look when it comes to a Mac system? And that's pretty much where this whole talk was born. And um, lots of research went into you know all that. So one thing that kind of jumps out at us. Well, most of you probably even saw the, talk, the title of the talk and you were wondering why you know, the title of the talk was excited or um, kind of piqued your interest because Max don't get viruses, right? You know? I mean, yeah, we laugh and obviously I'm going to disprove that, but the reason why that's important is because um, up until 2012, Apple themselves actually sold Max and their, on their website one of the features was um, Macs don't get PC viruses. That was still back in the, the Mac versus PC days. And, where, you know, it's part of their advertising. But now they've changed it since 2012 to say uh, Macs are secure by design. And they don't have the grandiose claim of Macs don't get PC viruses. And the reason for that is Flashback. Came out in 2012, took control of 600,000 systems as soon as it came out. 
Um, social engineering was used as far as getting people to install a flash plugin. This was still back when um, Macs didn't have flash plugins pre installed. And just a so uh, the, one of the major avenues for attack for Mac right now is apps that you not that, that people are going to need that they're going to go hunting for. So flash plugins or, or Java update stuff like that. Now these things get unfairly blamed a lot of times. Um, I, I think in Flash's case they really were insecure. But um, anyway, in this case it was a social engineering to get the flash plugin installed. And then it generated revenue through um, ads. So one thing to take away as far as Mac malware right now, it's, it's rather immature and most of them end up being just adware. So this one generated um, revenue through just displaying ads. A key thing that, that um, there are two points to it. One, it contained advanced features that weren't used. There was actually stubs in the code that researchers looked at and it they could have added a lot more features to it. They could have added command and control, they could have added um, uh, root kits, backdoors, all this stuff. It was a modular application, but it didn't have those. And then the second thing is it was weirdly sophisticated just for adware. Now I'm going to make the case throughout this talk that the iOS platform and the, well, the phone and the laptop the laptop is the staging ground for what goes on, or what's targeting the phone. So, and there's several reasons for that. So anyway, then we have Flashback Part 2 in 2014. And this is, um, so Intego, a company called Intego, bought these sinkholes that were from the first flashback. And what they were looking for is, how many people remain infected as time goes on? Um, the good news is, it was only about 20,000 or so people that remained infected up until they lost access to the sinkholes. The bad news is, there's still 20,000 people that were infected. So, Mac does a good, or Apple does a good job of pushing people to update as soon as it comes out. And they really, you know, have a nice interface for that. But they still suffer the same problem that Windows suffers, which is not everybody updates their systems as fast as they should. As fast as they should. In fact, um, how many of you have updated your iOS devices to the latest 935? No? Why not? Especially after I go through the um, what that means as far as the updates. But we'll get to that in just a second. So flashback part two, most researchers considered it no big deal because it's covered in an update. And so if you just update your device, you know, you're fine. But um, I would submit that it's still a big deal because it shows activity. And flashback part two was not just residual of the first flashback. They were actually iterating on that design going forward. So this one, uh, in one of the, so there's lots of different flash, so flashback part two is really just a catch-all for the different variants that came out after the first one. And the variants, uh, some of the variants were job. So a lot of you, you saw a lot of Apple blaming Java and a lot of people hating on Java. And Java is, there were some vulnerabilities there. I can give them a clean pass on it. However, some of it was just, they were taken off guard. So right around, or Apple was taken off guard because people are updating their software and there's, there's this vulnerable space. So, um, yeah, drive-by downloads, Blaming Java on that. And then the last event that I'll talk about in the pre and the setup to this is Key Ranger. Released in February 2016, I believe, it was the first OS X ransomware. And it was delivered through a signed application. So get into that in a second too. So that was worth noting. It's a signed application. So was um, well, the fake versions of of Flash and a fake version of Java, not necessarily signed. Actually, the unpatched B VM, that really was, yeah, that was a signed out. So, Key Ranger, first OS 10 ransomware delivered this year. I just saw um, a couple of days ago, there's another variant on Key Ranger that's just come out. So, all that to say is that, um, before we get into the unique attack, all that to say is that Mac malware is on the rise. 
It, um, it was a slow trickle um, a couple of years ago, maybe 200 a year. Now we're seeing about 10 a day. And that's nowhere near the volume of, the Windows, of, of Windows malware that you see. But if you think that the Macs are completely in the clear, they're not. Now, that said, I'm going to kind of taper that. I don't want to, to say that Macs are completely insecure. I still have all of my iOS devices and, and OS tens. But let's go through the unique attack vectors. If you are securing a system, if you just want to make sure that you're... Um, your family is secure, or you're secure. First, you're going to have to know what is it about Apple that makes it different fundamentally from a Windows system. And there's basically four different areas that I've come up with. There's the boot up process, the kernel, there's the way that software is installed, and something called Macho, which is the binary format that Mac uses natively. Does anybody know the native format for Windows? Off the top of your head? Packed executable 32. So, and that's interesting because as we go into boot process, in the beginning, um, every, so Apple security rises and falls on the boot process, especially on the iOS device. So I'm gonna, so an abbreviated boot sequence would be you power the device on, and in ages past, it was the BIOS that was the first thing that was given command. Now it is something called the EFI, the extended, um, I forget what EFI stands for. But anyway, that's the, the equivalent of the BIOS in, the, in most other PCs. That's what handles running. So EFI was developed by um, Intel, and oddly enough, it runs packed executable 32s, PE32s. So all of your iOS devices actually run a effectively a Windows executable in order to, to boot the whole device up. Now, it's just a PE32. It's a small file. Um, however, if you can take control of that file, then you can take control of everything beneath it. Because of that, Apple is really, really concerned about making sure that their boot up se sequence is as secure as possible. For instance, your um, well, EFI sits on a FAT32 partition. You usually don't see it. Um, this is where your firmware protections are. So um, on your iOS device, if you've got a passcode before you can get into your device, this boot sequence is what throws up the password screen first. You log into that, and then it persists the password back through to the kernel. So the EFI system is really important. It's what handles unlocking the disk for the for the, um, if you have whole disk encryption installed, all of that. So you can kind of, I'm really stressing that this is the most important part of the, especially iOS boot process. Um, the boot process is also what handles when your battery is dead, you plug your um, power cord in. EFI is what handles flipping the, the pictures back and forth that it's booting, or that it's uh, charging. And then it also runs another application once it's gotten to a certain charge, and flips it over to actually booting your entire system up. So if you're wondering why it is that you, you type in your password but you still have a delay before you can get into your system, that's because the system hasn't actually booted. It just went to the EFI part, you, were, you put in your credentials, and it still has to go through the rest of the boot process. We haven't even touched the kernel yet. Um, after the boot process, after EFI, then we go down to uh, loading the kernel. That's where kernel extensions are loaded. And that's also where dynamic libraries are loaded. Um, these are, uh, for those of you who aren't programmers, uh, pretty much all software is modular these days. Uh, these dynamic libraries include things like uh, the Cocoa framework that's used on, uh, well, it's, it's used on both OS X and iOS. But in the boot process, you can, um, especially on the iOS because of the limited um, memory and all that, they will preload a whole bunch of libraries. That's important because if you control one of these libraries that's preloaded, then you can take control of the whole system. One of the preloaded libraries is the image processing um, library. That's actually what the 934 update supposedly addressed. So this is where this becomes important when it comes to um, taking control of the system. Now, before I go too far, in the EFI section here, I list
Pi-star and Rebel EFI. So back when Jobs was still alive, one of the things that he hated the most was the idea that somebody would take one of his iPhones and install Android on it. That actually happened. It's called the iDroid. You can still look it up. There's still pictures of it. There's still some people that um, still keep one around. Of course, they're super old by now. But that kicked off an entire row of... Um, that, that's where the jailbreaking, the anti-jailbreaking, and everything else comes out. Now, the PyStar versus Rebel EFI. Rebel EFI, that was a company that came... PyStar was a company that, that started up, and they wanted to take... Uh, this was around the same time that Apple also went to selling their devices on, on uh, regular x86 Intel chips. So, PyStar had this bright idea, we're just going to, all it is that boosts the system up is the EFI. All it has to do is get control to, a, um, to the kernel. And once the kernel takes over, it does all it needs to do. So, they decided to write a, um, a bootloader. An EFI, just to get that to work on any hardware that Apple or that any any x86 compatible hardware. So Hackintosh. So these were the guys that started up an entire company um, just for selling Hackintosh, and it went all the way through up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ruled that the bootloader is copyrighted, and this is why your iOS device. That's why they're able to resist any um, jailbreaking attempts now is because of this ruling. So, as long as this ruling stays in place, they control the entire stack of um, the iOS device, not the OS, not the, um, not the laptop. So that's where the difference as far as bootloading begins and ends. And this is important because if, if Apple can guarantee everything from boot through the kernel for the iOS device, then a lot of these other security practices that they have in place, they have, um, you can be sure that they're giving you good information, not, not false positives. We'll get to that in a second. Um, the boot process also handles uh, Launch D, which we'll get into in a second. Uh, Launch D is the, the mecha. Everything that auto starts on a Mac starts through Launch D. Launch D is the uh, init of the Linux world. So everything runs as a subservice of LaunchD. LaunchD loads what are called plist files, and that's either XML or they could be compiled on iOS. They usually are compiled. But in your, on your OS X device, on your laptop, they're usually just plain text, which means you can just scan through them and see what they're doing. This is what handles uh, regularly scheduled jobs. It also handles um, uh, pretty much any uh, loading uh, KTEX kernel extensions, also drivers. So any of that stuff goes through uh, launch D. Well, usually specified in PLS. So another, uh, another aspect of this in the boot is the firmware DMA. How many of you have heard of the firmware um, DMA attack? It came out several years ago. Yeah. So it's interesting how many of these vulnerabilities exist, and then there's, they're quietly patched, and anyway... Mac, Mac security usually gets um, gets swept under the rug, so for whatever it's worth. So the FireWire DMA, direct, uh, DMA for direct memory access. So FireWire standard says that anything connected by a FireWire can just read and write the memory on whatever device it's connected to, which is an obvious problem. So the uh, this this is also what's could also be con concern or considered an evil maid attack, but Mac's solution to that was when the device boots up, if it has a password set, then direct memory access is denied. If the device, if the device has already booted up, then you connect something like a firewire to it, then you can do whatever you want to with it. Now, if the device is already booted up and you're, um, they usually have other controls in place, so it's not as bad as, as you may be thinking, but. Uh, another aspect of this is when you're charging your device or you're connected through the um, iTunes and you're syncing your device and all that, the boot, the boot process plays a role there. So to move on, I kind of want to get through the kernel real quick. It's kind of dense, but I want to get to the, 
the package application, stuff like that. But So the kernel is another attack surface. Um, interesting note about the, the OS X kernel, it's, um, this is the logo for the OS X kernel, um, ZNU, but <laughs> most people don't know this, it's not distinctly Mac. It's actually a hybrid of, um, well, BSD, which could be considered like the new interface, it's the POSIX interface, and then there's um, a, mock, a mock kernel. The mock kernel was developed at um, Next. If you remember your Apple history, uh, Jobs goes over to Next. Next has some really awesome technology, including mock. They also, they also had um, uh, the precursor to uh, what we use now for Xcode and, and a bunch of other cool stuff, interface builder. So mock was a microkernel. Many ever heard of a microkernel? Micro so there's basically two. You either have a monolithic kernel that handles all the device access, or a microkernel that's split up into multiple pieces. The problem with a microkernel, yeah, the problem with a microkernel is that if you have a bunch of pieces that are all sitting there in memory and they're not tightly integrated, like they're not all in the same address space. The promise of a microkernel is we pass messages to all these other places, and so the whole system doesn't fail if one piece fails. So if your device does something crazy and it writes memory the wrong way, the entire computer's not drugged down. However, the problem that you run into with microkernels is that they end up being really slow. So Apple has spent a lot of engineering fixing that problem. It's a really good the, the idea is academically sound. The problem is in, in the real world, we don't really, we're not willing to wait for our devices you know, just on the promise of that makes it more secure. So it's because of these um, compromises that some security flaws have, have come up. And there's really good presentations on, on a lot of these um, security flaws. And I have links to them towards the end. So. I run over this stuff while I'm talking, but hold on, there's handouts later. The last aspect is the macho format. It's similar to ELF, but the biggest difference, uh, ELF being the, the binary format that Linux uses nati natively, but the biggest difference is native code signing support. This means that um, uh, some other random trivial details, the uh, magic bytes for it or cafe babe, which is the same as the Java class file, which I think kind of fueled the feud between uh, Apple and Java to some degree, just because it's aggravating that the binaries contain the same magic bytes. You have to read a little bit more of it to figure out what it was. So the fact that they, the fact that Macho um, supports code signing natively is a fundamental piece of OS X security. So. Have any of you ever tried developing applications for, for OS X or iOS? Anybody? You have to pay, so simple cultural change. I've, I've developed applications for both Android and iOS, and I released the one for Android to the um, Play Store. Apple's, um, so releasing something to Android's Play Store cost about, well, it's actually free. You can release it all for free and you don't have to pay anything. Apple, though, last time I checked, it was about $100. And I, was, I used to get really, you know, why? Why is it $100? And the reason is because in order to run anything on an iOS device, it has to be signed by Apple themselves. So they can restrict. They're, that's why you can't do side loading or anything else on an iOS device. And remember, since they control the boot, they control everything below it. They could do the same thing for OS X, but most of us use our Macs for you know, most of us install third-party applications for Mac, although they're moving in that direction for, for um, OS X. The next version of OS X, um, Mac OS, it's going to have not only, so in the Mac OS now, or OS X now, code signing is required, or is turned on by default. You have to explicitly disable that. Um, no, that's in Mac OS. So, so Macho format was designed to work with that Mach kernel, and inside of it, it has some pretty solid engineering principles, but um, of course the performance problems uh, plagued it for a while. 
One of the things that they came up with to, um, to bypass some of that performance problem was the concept of ports. And they're not networking ports. And it's not even really a port in the sense that you're um, communicating. Well, you're communicating, but it's not um, over a wire. This is in intra-kernel communication. And the idea is that with a macho binary, you can request a service be performed by somebody. So I need maps to do something. And you send it through the kernel, and then maps in the kernel says, I have the ability to handle that. Here is a hook into my memory space. You know, go do something. A recent vulnerability that was actually released at uh, Black Hat this year, or last year, was basically DDoSing the kernel in this kernel and capturing one of those hooks. And then, of course, if you provide the running program with a hook into your code, then you own the entire program. So these are like native vulnerabilities. Now, I have not seen malware in the wild take control of that, but like, um, like you know, said, you know, we're, it, it's what you don't know that's going to bite you. So other uh, interesting things about Macho format is that it, it supports natively a universal binary format. And up until two versions back of OS X, there were some traces of PowerPC code that were still bundled in the binaries. Which is kind of weird because I haven't sold those in a really long time. Another aspect of Macho is the notion of resource forks. Um, the best way to describe resource forks is like how um, in a Windows environment an EXE could provide certain resources that the OS can look at, like an icon was the most popular example. Similar thing exists for for OS X. With the exception that in OS X, everything can have resource forks. This is actually a native thing that's supported by the file system. Or it's supported by the, the OS itself. Which brings me to software installation. So when I first transitioned over to Mac, the installation process was really I found it to be aggravating because I was used to there's a formal install program it puts things on the disk and you know where it needs to go and then usually um, usually Windows programs came with a formal uninstall program which actually took it all back out and then there's that nice add remove programs well the difference in Mac is um, applications are just binaries or the, the most common thing that you'll see in your applications folder are application bundles, which is really just a folder with a .app extension. Natively, Mac loves working with archives. That's actually supported transparently in the kernel, a, a bunch of different compression formats. DMG is one of the, the native, um, it, it basically an ISO file that you can mount, and you're mounting it from the system, that's why all these mounts show up when you go to install stuff. And then you drag that over into the applications folder, and all you're doing is overriding whatever was there. So some of the problems with DMG is that there's, there's really no magic bytes to determine whether a file is a DMG. For those of you who are doing network security, and you really want to find out fast what type of file is being downloaded, the bad news is for the DMG, the only spec is the last 512 bytes of the file will have, um, I think it's Coda Hale or, or uh, Kale or something in the last 512 bytes of the file. So you would have to go through the entire fight just to get to the very end and see if it's a DMG. Now, the, the way I've gotten around it is most DMGs are packed um, as BZIP files. And so we'll get to, yeah. Most of them are packed BZIP files. So DMG is natively um, compressed. And because it's natively compressed, it also supports native encryption. In fact, when you go to update your iOS device, what you're doing is you're downloading a DMG. And it, the system is basically pointing to that DMG as the mount point the next time the device boots up. So when you see the updating Mac OS, whatever, it's coming from a DMG file. Now, the closest we get to an installation program in the Apple world is a PKG. PKGs are DMGs wrapped with a um, 
basically scripts. So there's a bill of materials that's involved there. Uh, give you an idea. Well, no, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. So it's native. PKGs are usually natively compressed in a ZAR format. That's um, by spec. It doesn't have to be ZAR. So ZAR is a. Um, a most people use tar and gzip together. Well, ZAR just combine both of them. It's actually kind of cool. Um, and then the last common way to install applications is through App Store, which is doing the same thing the others are, except they're signed, and it enforces code signing down the line. So, now that I've sufficiently pointed out how many things can go wrong with Apple, I wanted to dial this back because this doesn't need to be a code read. Most of us went into this thinking that our iOS devices and, uh, and uh, OS X devices were generally secure, and they are. And here's the things that um, Apple has tried to do. So on the bootloader, which enforces Apple's walled garden, there is the um, file vault system. That, that is what protects the whole disk encryption. This is what also, um, if you have a password set on your device, and I encourage you to go in, boot your device into maintenance mode, put, at least put a password on it, because that blocks a whole lot of threats, like the direct, the, the direct, memory, um, direct memory access, it also um, thwarts um, some other physical access issues. For your iOS device, it blocks plugging in, you know, the evil um, plug attack, somebody already tweeted today about the uh, charging station out there and the um, possibility of that being an evil um, plug attack. Having a password on your device would actually mitigate some of that, especially your iOS device. Um, of course, Apple was one of the first ones to provide ASLR, address space layout randomization, everywhere on all of, every part of their system, whereas with others it was kind of slowly rolled out over time. Theirs was almost a sea change overnight. Everything is ASLR. Um, Gatekeeper, which um, macho binaries also have what are called file, file attributes. This is part of the file system itself. Um, each file can have any number of attributes. Most of them only have a handful or so. So Gatekeeper is when you download, um, yeah, when you download an, an application or binary from the internet, it's tagged as this came from the internet. And then Gatekeeper is what, is what throws up the, the dialogue to say, you downloaded this from the internet, are you really sure you want to run it? And you've probably seen where you can't just double click on it, especially in Safari, you have to go find it, and right click on it, and open it. And it's, it's a behavioral thing, but these are the types of protections that are going on in the background. Another one that's, um, that's a file quarantine, works along with gate, Gatekeeper. Um, Xprotect, there's actually a hash lookup service in OS X. Um, where you, so a lot of these viruses, the reason why, so there's the 600,000, and after that is what spurred Apple on to quickly put out all of these pieces. So a lot of the viruses I'll show you towards the end here that you should still keep an eye out for, they don't have the penetration as the first one because Apple themselves can remotely convict um, hashes. So XProtect, and then what's coming up next is Sandbox. Sandboxing is, is already baked into the kernel. They're still working out some bugs with it. Um, basically, containerization in the Apple um, environment. In uh, app applications that are installed via the App Store are run in sandboxes. So it's not just that it's signed, and that's another part of it, is, um, or another built-in protection is application signing. It's really hard to get somebody's um, code signing certificates, although that is something that has, has happened as well. So last part, application firewall. Um, Apple has its own, um, any, any code that is installed that is not signed is subject to the application firewall. And if it thinks that your application is doing something particularly bad, for example, if you're running um, IntelliJ or, you know, if you're writing an application and you're trying to run it and you run it on one of the privileged ports, below uh, 5,000, I think, or no, below 6,500, 6, yeah, then um, it complains about that. 
However, if it's signed, a lot of those restrictions fall away, and that's why Mac malware now seeks the, the, the most attractive target is signed applications where the developers are kind of careless with the keys. So with that, I wanted to go over just a survey of Mac malware, and this is the popular Mac malware. This is the type of stuff that you'll run into when you, um, you know, like if my daughter comes to me, these are the types of things that I'm, I'm worried about actually being on her system. Mac Keeper is the number one. Um, because the number one attack vector is developers who don't have a tight control over their security, their code signing practices, companies that are kind of shady in the first place, like Mac Keeper, they're going to be the number one targets for malware. So they've come out with a lot of press release, Mac Keeper is actual company, but they've come out with press releases saying that people have just you know, been tarnishing their name and releasing malware under their name, it's not them. Well, the reason why they're being picked on is because they're careless with their keys and their code site. <clears throat> so because of that, Mac Keeper is usually the source of a lot of adware, a lot of, um, it's not necessarily malicious. Most places that you'll see on uh, VirusTotal will, will classify it as PUA, uh, potentially on one application. And like I said, most of this stuff is um, kind of in a shady realm. Opinion Spy like, is another one in that same category. It's, um, well, this one really does cross the line into malware. It'll stream information back. Not necessarily privileged information, but it's getting there. And that's important because we'll get to a later stage that is actual full uh, malware. Um, Eleanor came out about four, four or five months ago, and that was a true backdoor um, capturing uh, command and control. Um, its reach, though, was pretty limited. Um, maybe 10, 20,000 for it. And because, because Apple has done a good job so far of locking down these threats, my, remember my theory from the beginning that Mac is the staging ground, the OS X is the staging ground for what goes on the iOS. The real difference between the iOS and, um, th there's, there's very few differences between iOS and, um, and the OS X. So, moving along, you've got Wire Lurker, or, yeah, Wire, Wire Lurker, which actually targeted both iOS and Mac, um, install, installs uh, malicious applications and steals, actually steals personally identifiable information. And it also tried, to, it, it, many of these viruses um, seek out other things that are installed on in the system, and this one was no different. It looked for, um, program called, just blanked on the name, is a Mac uh, fire, firewall client. Well, we'll get to that in a second. Um, Little Snitch. Yeah, Little Snitch is the, is the number one target for a lot of these applications. So um, just a plug for those guys because it actually, if the malware is targeting, it's a good, it's a good indication that it's pretty good and pretty um, capable of of blocking a lot of this bad stuff. Mac Defender is another one. Um, phishing, Key Ranger, like I mentioned before, is ransomware. And then you've got several others. So like I said, the... Um, Uh, there's also Pegasus Exploit, which also affected iOS, and Adwin, Rat, uh, Keydnap, that was the one that I was thinking about. Keydnap is the next evolution of, and that came out in August, sorry, it was a little bit after I put these slides together. Um, Keydnap came out and it actually dumps credentials from the, um, or tries to dump credentials from the, the keychain. There's actually proof of concepts for attacking the keychain as well, scripts that you can use, and, and we'll get to that in just a little bit. But before I, um, before I go on, um, there's actually a few other slides that I, or a few other, not slides, but I mentioned earlier that applications that were poorly developed end up being the attack vector. So going forward, what you should really look for is, so 
the Sparkle updater, back in February, a researcher noticed that um, anything using the Sparkle updater, which there's a lot of open source utilities, you know, people use the same sort of transport mediums and other commonalities. So VLC is a good example of this. It uses something called Sparkle Update. So you can, um, as in most things in security, if you, you can secure everything that you know about, but if the application itself is doing bad things, then it makes it a lot harder for Apple to come along and say, you know, this is bad. So several applications have gotten into the habit of updating themselves, not waiting for the user to go to the App Store or anything else. So VLC is one of those. It'll say, you know, an update's available, would you like to go do that? And what it did, what it did was it would download the, the DMG package and then um, shut itself off, transfer that in the background, and, and boot it back up. So uh, there was not an active malware that took advantage of this. And what I'd like to really convey, too, is that a lot of Mac malware is pretty immature based on what we've seen from Windows malware. So Mac malware, uh, this, was an, uh, this was a vulnerability in the um, Sparkle update. A lot of other um, utilities use this as an auto-update feature. Um, it, it was a vulnerability because it used uh, HTTP instead of HTTPS, so it could be hijacked to go to any other place and, and download an update from there. One that just came out recently, like just came out recently, was Dropbox. Um, Dropbox actually, without letting you know, installs into the accessibility tab a hook that they've put there. And the reason why that's bad is because they effectively have root privileges on the box. And a lot of their stuff, when, they, uh, when they're installing, and it's not really clear to the user, you're not just giving it the ability to install, you're also giving it the ability to control your system. This is a vulnerability, not an active exploit, but if it does become an exploit, then, of course, Dropbox would be a, a source of malware. Now, they did respond today, and I was just reading it um, about 15 hours ago. And I was just reading a little bit of it earlier, but I'm pretty sure they'll have a good explanation on why they need those, why they need that access. My point is, applications themselves um, and the developers for those applications are, are the targets today for Mac malware. Another um, source, I mentioned the Firewire um, direct memory access, so physical vulnerabilities also include USB. So uh, this was another proof of concept issued recently. Um, and the basic idea is a USB device that presents itself as, so it presents itself as a network device, and because of the way that the kernel extensions are loaded, it, um, it the first thing Mac does, it has the bonjour service and asks the device, you know, do you have any, do you have any network services? So it'll run DHCP discovery on a new, what it sees as a network device. And so, you can have a USB device that presents itself as a network device and then also runs a DHCP server, and that can bypass security consideration or security controls back up to back up to the kernel. So, and it's interesting that this ends up being a, um, a cross-platform attack, both Mac and Windows. Um, so my. Uh, Thanks for attending. There's three things I wanted to point out. The handouts are available at this address. I'm going to leave this up there. I'll also tweet it out later. Um, there was an enormous amount of material for this talk. And if nothing else, I want to leave you with the, the notion that Mac malware is a rich field. The technology that Macs are based on is 30 years old in some cases. It's, it's old. It is battle-tested, but there's still a lot of security research that is yet to be done on that. We're just scratching the surface on it. This year, we had um, security researchers turn their eye to Mac um, more so than in other years, and they found three, almost you know, several, several vulnerabilities in rapid succession. And I think that we're, we're just starting to see people take Mac as seriously as a, as a target. In fact, to, to kind of bolster that argument, Apple um, 
a couple of months ago, just announced a bug bounty program, which they had been adamantly opposed to before. Now they will pay $200,000 if anybody finds a vulnerability in the kernel, which again, you own the kernel, you own the entire system. However, security company came out right after that and said that they would pay 500000 for a kernel vulnerability. <laughs> now that all sounds well and good, but if you go back, and I encourage you to read this, actually I'll leave this slide up, but I encourage you to read it, the NSO group, they licensed their stuff for 600000 So Mac, it's the law of supply and demand. Mac vulnerabilities are highly valued. Now, because they're highly valued, the good news for the average person is they're probably not going to target you with a highly valued piece of malware. You're probably just going to get adware instead. However, um, pay attention to what's running on your Mac. Um, utilities, uh, I didn't have time to get to these utilities, but two that I wanted to point out, well, no. Just pay attention to what goes on in the OS X Security Awesome list and the Homebrew tab. Anybody who's using a Mac probably uses Homebrew anyway, so I set up this Homebrew tab for a bunch of utilities. They're not, they're not necessarily security, but they could be used for forensics. One of them is a launch D command that you can go through and uh, dump out what's been running. For example, this. This is the launch D command, ligonx. And here's everything that starts on my system at startup. But to give you an idea of this, the attack surface that's on a Mac, if I look at all the system um, stuff that started up, then all of a sudden we'll have to start scrolling for a while. Every one of these could have something going on with it. Just to give you an idea. Now, not all of them are, I mean, they're pretty well put together anyway, but you still probably want to know what's going on in your Mac. The good news is, for Windows, though the Windows versus Mac malware environment, it's really kind of transparent on a Mac what's running. If it's not in launch D, it doesn't run. So with that, I'll open the floor up for questions. And let me switch back to the slides so we can go there. We have, we have time for about one question. OK. Any uh, burning question? I'll probably get into that yeah, too. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to figure out a question to ask. Does anybody know the, can anybody name the, the debugging utility in OS X or, or in uh, Xcode? Do I have any Xcode developers in here at all? No? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, let me try to scale that back out a little bit. Sorry? So it's not GDB, is it? No. <laughs> well, GDB is one of them. But, well, it's not native. Um, yeah, there's a whole other kernel stuff because, like, GDB, Apple actually ships their own version of GDB so that you don't um, interrupt with their other stuff. They also ship their own version of malloc, weirdly enough. So, yeah, other stuff. Um, uh, yes. Sorry? Valbrand? Valbrand? No. Um, no, no, it's actually instruments, is what I was thinking about. D trace instruments, all that stuff. How about you? Need a couple of questions? Yeah. What was the. There was a web based storage product that installs a little app with that effectively gives that app root privileges. Oh, yeah. Dropbox. Dropbox. There we go. I heard three people, but I heard. Sure, hers was the loudest. Yeah, I think that's actually got a turn. One of the loudest, the one yeah, of the worst. Yeah, one of the loudest. You get the first choice. So. You want iOS application security or Python for Python for it. All right. Um, that means the uh, gentleman over here gets iOS application security, which I told Bill earlier that uh, that's all my great idea. Well, it'll be shipped to you now. Right? <laughs> 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 Okay, yeah. yeah, we still have time for one more question if anybody has them. Otherwise, I'm going to get out of the way for the next few Yes? You said there was a mitigation uh, of the password on something for when people plug in at that. Mm -hmm. The password was for what service? So if you go into the BIOS on the OS 10 and set a password there, plugging you know, evil mate attacks where you plug in devices, that gets blocked. Otherwise, I can't block it because. It's just, it's a passing. 
class happened. Thanks for the work you can password. Thank you, Wes, very much. Thank you. Appreciate your time. That's recording.